All right, welcome to a new tutorial. Today we're going to be going over this IMAX counter, as you can see on screen. I'm going to be going over how to create this in Blender, as well as using Fusion to composite it. Now, don't worry if you don't know either program, this is going to be very beginner friendly. I'm going to go through everything. So it's a great entry point if you're just getting started. Today we're going to be covering modeling and texturing and the basic animation. We're going to get 80% of the way there, so this is going to be a longer one, but I want to give you something working by the end of this. After that, we're going to focus on the details by adding effects and doing the passes later on. So look forward to that. And with that, let's just dive right in. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Blender. What you can do is you just click in here and get past the start screen. I'm going to go ahead and reset everything just to make sure that we're starting at the same point. So I'm going to go in here. I'm just going to go to file. I'm going to go to defaults. I'm going to go load factory settings. And that should clear away any other stuff that I have that may be different than yours. Let's go over basic navigation. I can zoom in and out with my mouse wheel. I can hold it down and I can rotate. If I hold shift and I move around, I can pan. The other big one is the period key. It's on your number pad, not the one on your keyboard. That one will throw you off. It'll allow you to zoom in and rotate around your object. So if you're having trouble getting to an object, you're trying to grab something far away, it's really handy to click on it and then hit the period key and then it'll zoom right into it and then you'll be able to rotate around it. All right, now on to the main controls you use. You can use G for grab. That'll allow you to grab an object. You can then hit X after that, or Y or Z, to move it along the X axis, the Y axis, or the Z axis. You don't have to hit G again. You can just switch between those three by hitting X, Y, or Z. You can use S to scale things up. Again, X, Y, or Z to scale them along those axes. And then you can use R for rotation. Again, X, Y, or Z to rotate those around those axes. And if you want to cancel that move, you can just hit Escape to cancel it. The other one you're going to use is tab that'll transfer you from the object mode to the edit mode. The object mode allows you to change things in regards to the object like scale and rotation. Edit mode lets you do finer details. You can do the edges, you can do the points, or you can do the faces. If you use one on your keyboard, you can select points. If you hit two on your keyboard, you can select an edge. If you hit three, you can select a face. Now this is not to be confused with your number pad. These are the ones right above your letter keys. The numbers on your number pad will correspond to views. So one will do a front facing view, three will do a side view, seven will do a top view, and then there's a bunch of other ones in between. So that's about 80% of what we're going to be doing in Blender. Um, the rest of it we're going to cover as we go along. All right, so now I hit tab and I'll get out of that and I'll go back to object mode. Now would be a good time to turn on a few preferences. So we'll go to edit preferences and under system, there are a few things that you'll want to turn on. So one is the undo steps. For some reason, it's defaulted to really low, go ahead and turn up to its max of 256. That way, if you want to undo something like a lot of things, you can just go ahead and do that. If you want, you can go ahead and make it the install default, which is probably a good idea. And while we're here, go ahead and under CUDA, if you have an NVIDIA graphics card, go ahead and turn that on. Um, this will help a ton with rendering when we get to that. I'm going to intentionally do this in the EV render engine so that doesn't tax your computer too much, but still, if you have it, use it. And lastly, under load and save, make sure you have auto save turned on because when Blender crashes, which it will eventually, you'll want to have a backup. Okay, so we can go ahead and exit out of that. We're going to do what is a Blender ritual at this point, and we're going to delete this default cube. So go ahead and select it, and you can either hit delete or X, and you can get rid of it. So now we're going to use our main hotkey to bring in a new object. So hit shift A, and go ahead and bring in some text. First thing I'm going to do is hit seven on my number pad to bring in my top view. So I'm going to go over my icon here, which is our text icon. I'm going to go to alignment and I'm going to set um, both horizontal and vertical to center. So the main idea here is we want this to be our endpoint for our final text. So I'm going to back up everything from that point. So now I'm going to rotate that. So it's upright. I'm going to rotate it on the X axis. And if you hit R, you can rotate it actually by a specific number. So if you hit R and then X, and then follow that by the number 90, it'll rotate at 90 degrees. You can also hit a negative in there. It doesn't matter if it's before or after the 90, that'll do the opposite. So now it's upright, but it's looking kind of flat. So I'll want to give it some depth, change the font. To do that, go ahead and hit tab to go into edit mode. We can erase it and I'm going to give it something really original, like, I don't know, final text. So now we have the text changed, um, but now we get need to give some depth. We can do this in either edit or object mode. Uh, we just need to go in and under geometry, change extrude. For now, I'll just give it 0.1, and then we need to change the font. I don't like the font, so I'm going to go ahead and change that. And what I found that looks pretty good, close to the IMAX font, is Corbel. Should be pretty standard on your computer. If it's not, you know, go ahead and choose whatever font that looks good. This is yours after all. Now, last thing we want to do with this is give it a bevel. Um, the text in the original actually has a bevel on it. So I'm going to go ahead and go down to bevel. We have a couple options here. We have round, we have object. What I'm going to do is go with profile, which means we can actually create a little bit of our own. So in looking from the reference, it's got a little bit of an S curve. So I'm just going to move these points around, give it a little bit of an S. It's not working. And there's a reason for that is because I forgot to put on an extrude depth. 
So go ahead and add some depth, um, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, you know, go crazy. I'm just going to adjust this profile a little bit, make it a little bit smoother, um, maybe more predictable. I like things that are repeatable, um, which will not end well by the end of this tutorial because I'm going to tweak things way out of control and I will have no idea what I've actually used, but I'll do my best to give you direction. Okay, so now we can hit tab and go back into object mode if you're not already. Now we need to make duplicates of this because we have text all over the place. Um, the easy way to do that is to hit shift D. That'll give you a duplicate. And if you hit escape, you can make sure it's in the same spot. Hit G, hit Y. Now we can move it along the Y axis and I'm gonna move it like negative 20. Then I'm gonna hit shift D again. I'm gonna duplicate that one and I'm gonna move it in the Y direction, negative 2.5. Then I'll duplicate those and I'll hit G, Y, negative five. And then I'll grab all four of those and I'll hit G, Y, negative 10. Now we should have all our text components and now we just need to go into edit mode and change them all to the number values. And now that I'm looking at that one, I can see that my extrude is probably a little bit too aggressive. So I'm gonna go and make that in half, say 0.05. I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna relabel these real quick. I'm just gonna zoom through it because you don't have to watch it because well, you know how to do it at this point. So tab in, change it, tab in, change it and go all the way through. So if I go to my front view, you may notice that the numbers aren't exactly aligned. So I'm going to fix those. I'm going to hit G and I'm going to lower these. You can also move them with the menu. If you don't have this menu at the side, you can hit N to bring it out and you can manipulate the values from there. So let me go ahead and line these up. All right, now that that is looking good, so we need to go ahead and start naming some of these things. Right now we just have a bunch of things that say text, text, text everywhere. So go ahead and go over to your little menu there and go ahead and double click on any of the names and go ahead and rename them. I'm gonna go ahead and do them really fast. I'm just going to name them what they are so it's easy to find, especially in the template. Now the other thing we can do is we can put these all in a collection. So we can turn them on and off together and this will help us with rendering things out a lot later. So go ahead and right click, put in a new collection, and then go ahead and just drag and drop all of those inside of that collection. And then I'm just gonna name that collection text. Make sure you don't have stuff in there like your light or camera, leave those out into your main scene collection. We don't wanna turn those on and off along with our text. So now I'm gonna go ahead and delete the light and camera because we don't need it and we're gonna make our own. Now I did make a mistake here, whenever you're clicking around, sometimes you can move the center point and stuff's gonna be added in where you have that center point. And that's not where I wanna put that camera, so I'm gonna go ahead and change it. To fix that, all I have to do is hit Shift S, and then I'll go cursor to world origin, and that'll put that point right at the beginning where we started. And now I can go ahead and add in a camera. I just need to hit Shift A, and then I can drop that in. And I wanna put it at negative 40, so I'll hit G Y, negative 40. And if I wanna see what my camera's actually looking at, I just have to hit zero on my number pad, and I'll zoom right in. That's my camera frame. It's a little bit off. You can see that my rotation and my coordinates are a tiny bit off. So let's go ahead and zero those out. And I made one mistake um, looking at this and that's because my X rotation should actually be 90. So let's go ahead and fix that. So now we're looking straight on. That's exactly where we want to be. I'm um, looking pretty good. So let's move on. So now I'm going to save it. You can hit control S or you can go to file, save, save often. It's a shame when you don't save and then Blender crashes and you lose a bunch of stuff. So do it, do it often. So I went ahead and saved that. I'm going to try and save a template for each video. So when you're starting, you just grab the template and you don't get left behind in the videos. Maybe you're on the second video and you didn't make it all the way through the first one. I do, however, suggest that you go through some of this, at least on your own. This is part of the reason just to learn it and get familiar with Blender. But I will have those available for those who want to catch up right away. So now that we have our camera in there, we need to animate it so it's actually moving toward our final text. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put in a frame range. Looking at the reference, it looks about 40 seconds. I'm gonna assume 30 frames per second is what we're gonna use, so I'm gonna go with 1200 frames. So now we need to animate the camera. So I'm gonna go up to this menu here, again, hit N to show it if it's hidden, and add in a keyframe. We want it to be at 40, so I'm gonna right click, and I'm going to add single keyframe. If I hit all keyframes, it'll just keyframe that whole selection, but I just need one. So now I'm going to go to the end, somewhere probably around 1100 frames. Go ahead and make it negative 10. These are just starting positions. We're going to go ahead and change things as we go. Orange means that I've made a change, but it's not saved. To save it, I actually need to right click and say insert keyframe. Now the other way to do it is to turn on auto keyframing. And then every time you make a change, it'll automatically update just like it would do in DaVinci Resolve. I find it to be a pain though, so I'm just going to leave it off for now. Okay, so it's looking too far away. So I'm going to go ahead and change it to something like negative eight. It didn't stick. You can see once I move it, move back to negative 10. That's because I didn't have the keyframe on. So I'm going to turn on auto keyframing, change it to negative eight, and now it'll stick. I'm still looking a little far away, so let's go ahead and go negative five, let's say. I'm going to change this probably again anyway, so don't get too hung up on the numbers. Now if we go ahead and look through our camera, 
when see have a nice animation rolling through things. It doesn't look super impressive. We're gonna change that as we go. But for now, it gives us a nice base animation that we can use to then branch out and do more complicated things. Okay, so for now, it's probably got an ease in, ease out curve on it, which is fine. We'll probably change that a little bit later, but we'll just leave it for now. If you ever can't find your keyframes, one thing you can do is you can go over to where your keyframes are and hit the home button on your keyboard. This is a little known use button. You probably don't even know it exists, but it'll help bring your keyframes into focus. And that's true for anything. If you're in the shading tab and you hit it, you'll find where your nodes are hiding. It's a good navigation tool for when you're getting lost and can't find stuff in Blender, which happens. So now we have our camera in there, we actually need to reference something so we know what we're making. There's a few ways that you can do this. Uh, the first way I originally did it is just to bring up the IMAX countdown anthem and set it to like 0.25 and then just adjust things by eyeball. That's not a very good way to do it. A better way to do it is to either use OBS to screen record or what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the 4K video downloader. So to do that, it's really easy once you have the 4K downloader installed, go ahead and copy your link, then you go ahead and paste it in. Again, you can use OBS to record, and that's a better option for longer videos that you just want a piece of. Um, since we want the whole thing, we're just gonna download it. And this gives you some cool options. You can use the video, you can just have the audio. This is why I like to use it sometimes. So for this next part, we're gonna to need to cut down the clip. So I'm gonna bring it into DaVinci Resolve. I'm just gonna cut off the front part of that because I don't need that countdown. I don't need that 2D animation. One thing I didn't realize when I was doing this the first time is that I actually have this in 30 frames per second. I probably downloaded a video at 24 frames per second. So there's gonna be some duplicate frames in there. You can decide whether you wanna stick with 30 or go down to 24. You'll have to change that in your Blender timeline. You can hit control backslash to make a cut and then you can delete the front part of that clip and then you can hit alt and click on the audio and just delete the audio. Again, if you do the recording with OBS on the screen record, then you probably don't have to do this step. So while I'm here, I'm gonna save this because we're gonna be coming back to this and we're gonna be putting it all together at the end. So right now it's 37 seconds long, it's almost 38 seconds. So what I can do is I can just hit period on the keyboard and move it over a single frame and then I'll just stretch out the front. So now it's exactly 38 seconds, which is two seconds shorter than our Blender timeline, but that's okay, we'll want a little bit of extra room in the Blender timeline so we can fade off into something else. A little bit of extra room, never hurt anybody. So go over to this Deliver tab and we're going to export it. So just go ahead with some default settings like H.264 QuickTime, doesn't really matter. We just need it small, it's just a reference video. Go ahead and name it, kick it out to downloads, desktop, wherever it is that you want to have it. Add it to the queue and then render. All right, now we do this in Blender. Now there are a few ways you can get a reference in Blender. One way is to bring in an image plane and just have it as an image. You can also just bring in the clip on its own. That's an option for that. The problem with that is that our reference is moving. And the best way to do that, I think, is this little trick, which I'm about to show you, is to attach it to the camera. So select your camera, go ahead and go to this camera icon. Now, when you scroll down, you can go under background image, and we're going to attach a background image. So go ahead and go to movie clip, go to open, go ahead and find your clip, and bring it right in. And you won't be able to see it because it's attached to the camera, so if I hit zero to go into the camera, it'll be purple, but the reason it is, is because we're on frame zero. Nothing's happening on frame zero. We're in frame one to 1200. So if I go to frame one, there it is. Now I have a reference to move things and shift things around. So now the real benefit of this is we can move our camera angle. So I can go ahead and go here. I can go ahead and shift my camera up and down. I can go ahead and move it so it's getting the exact same perspective as my reference video. Pretty slick, huh? And all I need to do is go through and add in keyframes to where I want certain spots to be and align my text up with the reference image. Now to help with my timing and my reference here, notice these rotating bars, we're gonna add those in because those are rotating at a constant rate. I can use that to help me time things. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn back on my text. I'm gonna hit Shift S and I'm gonna go cursor to selected. So I don't wanna make this at the origin, I wanna make it on the eight. Then I'll go ahead and hit Shift A and add in a sphere. And that is huge, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it down. I'm going to put S.1. Now you'll notice that there are a bunch of things on here that are yellow. That's because I accidentally had auto keyframe on. Um, like I said, it's a bit of a pain, so I'm gonna turn that off and I'm gonna go ahead and delete all these keyframes and clear them. So now it's done, let's go ahead and see where these things should be. Turn off our text, turn off that sphere. And it looks like they're sitting a little bit behind the numbers, so we're gonna to have to shift them back a bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn everything back on. Let's turn back on the sphere, and let's go ahead and move it. And move it like 0.05 back, so I'm gonna go ahead and just change this to negative 37. Uh, it's still looking a little bit big, so let's go ahead and shrink it down. So let's go scale 0.5, half of what it is right now. So now we need the big bar coming out of it, so let's go ahead and add that in. So we can hit Shift S, cursor to select again, then we'd hit 
shift A and we're going to add in a cylinder. Now there's going to be a little menu down the side and we're going to have to open that and change a few parameters. If you uh, place it without changing anything, this there's no way to change it again. You'll just have to replace it. So make sure that you don't click away and just go ahead and open this menu. So I like to make the cylinder 64, it smooths them out a little bit. Let's go ahead and make the uh, radius say 0.01 and we might get away with two. Yeah, let's stick with two for the height. So now I hit G, Z, and one. Uh, because it's a length of two, I just need to move it up one. Now I'm having trouble, I wanna to get to that sphere and I'm having a little bit of trouble doing it. So go ahead and select it, hit period on your number pad and that'll zoom in, now I can rotate around it. So now we can add in a little optical trick. We can right click and go to shade smooth. Now, this doesn't actually change the mesh, it just changed the appearance, so when we render it out, it'll look like that. But if you're trying to 3D print or do something else like that, it won't actually have that nice smooth surface, so just be aware of that, whatever you're trying to do here. This works perfectly fine for our purposes and does what we want. So shade smooth the rod as well. Now what we need to do is have this rod rotate with the sphere. So to do that, we need to go up to Object, now we can go to Set Origin, and we can do Origin to where the 3D cursor is, which is in the center of that sphere right now. So now when I hit R and try and rotate this, it'll rotate the way that I want it to. The other thing I do is I can just rotate it together. So if I select the rod here and then I shift click on the sphere, you see the yellow highlight, I can hit Control P and I can parent that rod to the sphere. So now when I rotate the sphere, the rod moves along with it. So that's exactly what we want. So now we just need to add in some keyframes to get it moving the way we want. So now we need to just make like seven more of those. So let me go ahead and shift D and zip through them. So now I have it, but the one problem is they're not rotating. So now we add keyframes for them to rotate. So before we do that, let's go ahead and put these in their own collection. If I try and put the spheres in the collection, it'll take the cylinders out. I'm not sure why. So go ahead and just grab all the cylinders and put them in the same uh, collection. They're still parented together, so they work fine. Let's just go ahead and put them in there and clean that up. So now I need to rotate them into their starting position, and then I need to figure out what kind of speed they are with another keyframe. So let's go ahead and turn off our text so we can see them better. I could rotate these one by one, but that would be a huge pain, and there's a much better way to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do what I did before, and I'm going to parent all these to an empty. So I'm going to hit Shift A, and then I'm going to add in a sphere. I'm going to put it at like negative 40, so it's a little bit out of the way. Then I can just go through, grab all of them, and parent them to the empty. The one you're going to parent to is the one that's going to be yellowish orange. And now I can hit control P and I can parent all those together. So now you can see that they all move together and I can use that to control all of them. So go ahead and grab the empty, go ahead and put it in the collection. And then we'll just go over here and we'll start rotating it till it lines up. Let's go ahead and make sure that's on our first frame. Let's go to our empty. We'll rename it rotation and then we'll add in a single keyframe. Then we'll go through, it looks like frame 83 lines up pretty well. And we will add a plus 360 and then insert single keyframe. Now you can tell when it starts and stops, there's a little bit of wonkiness and it also doesn't keep going. So let's go ahead and fix that. To do that, I'm going to add in another window. So go over and right click on the edge and put in a vertical split. And then we'll go up and we will change this to the graph editor for our keyframes. So make sure you hit normalize, otherwise sometimes the keyframes are hard to see. Normalize will just expand it and make it a lot more visible. Now we can zoom in and we can see our keyframes. So select your keyframes, right click, go to your interpolation mode, and we're gonna set it to linear. Now when we play it, there's no easing in or easing out. It's gonna start right away and stop right away. But we also want it to keep going, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit Shift E and go to linear extrapolation. That's just gonna make sure that keeps going on forever and ever in either direction based on the slope that we have with our keyframes. And you can see it just keeps going and going and going. Now it's a little bit off, but what we can do with that is we can just grab this last keyframe and just move it toward an end value until it lines up. So it might not be 80 frames, maybe it's like 83 frames or something, so let's just move it a little bit. All right, now that's looking pretty darn good. All right, so we have our timing down. We're not gonna need this window anymore, so what we can do is we can right click on it and we can go to join areas and then just drag it off to the right. All right, so now that we have our timing in place, let's go ahead and grab our camera and we're just going to adjust the keyframe. So I'm gonna turn on auto keyframes for this and I'm just gonna move around the position and adjust it in a few spots. Starting position is not too bad, but as I go in through here, you can see that we should already be through the eight. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab my Y position and I'm just gonna back it up a little bit. So go ahead and move it back, move the camera down a little bit, um, right about there. So one thing I'm noticing as I'm going through this is our numbers are pretty close together. So one thing we can do is we can either space out our numbers a lot more or we can shrink them down so that the relative distance between them looks right. Um, so I'm just gonna go through and I'm gonna shrink these down a little bit. 
So I've gone ahead and scaled everything down by 0.5. Let's go ahead and see what that looks like. So that's looking a lot better. That's looking a lot more like what we should have in the shot. So I'm gonna go ahead and start moving these things around. So let's turn off the spheres so we can just look and focus on the text one thing at a time. I'm just gonna run through here. This is kind of the creative process of this is make sure you're keyframing everything, just moving stuff around, getting it all lined up. In all honesty, this is just me messing around for like 40 minutes just trying to get stuff lined up. It's tedious, but it's part of the process and it's kind of fun once you get into it and you start tweaking all the little parameters. Um, so do a little bit of your own, but again, there's a template if you don't wanna go through it. Now we can go ahead and look through this and see how it goes. Um, one thing we can do is if we don't like how it's looking, we can also open the graph editor again and just tweak the different uh, parameters like the Z location and the Y location. We can delete points if we don't need them. I often go through and if it looks like I don't need it, I will delete it. We're not going to get exact because one thing to remember is that IMAX countdown was probably done over the course of a few weeks with a bunch of iterations and it was probably done in a different software like Maya. So we're not going to get it 100% accurate. But one thing you can do is to smooth things out and get it looking you know rather nice in the way you want it to look and if you ever need to see it without the background on you can just go to your camera go ahead and uncheck that background image and you can go ahead and look at it and this is what it looks like with our current camera and the keyframes I put in there obviously there's more effects and rotations we need to add. we'll get all that ironed out as soon as we get the camera animation in a good place where we want it you'll go back and forth quite a bit throughout this but before I spend any more time on animation, let's go ahead and make this look nice. Let's go ahead and add in some materials to these numbers here. I'm gonna go on my eight. I'm gonna go down to the material tab. Go ahead and click on that. Click on the plus and add in a new material. Let's go ahead and name it metal. Now you're not gonna see anything once we do that. What you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to change your display mode. So go up to the top here. We're just in the basic mode. You can choose either one of these and I'll show you your material. One is like a pre-rendered mode. The other one is the rendered with the background and everything else in it. To make the material, it's really easy. We're just gonna crank our metallic all the way up. We're gonna bring down the roughness to around 0.1. And then we're gonna make a few more adjustments on these. But to do that, we're gonna to go to the shading editor. So up at the top, you have your shading tab. Go ahead and click on that. And here are the nodes that we already have. We've already changed the settings on these, but we're gonna add in a few extra things to make it work a little bit better. One thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add in a transparent texture. So again, hit Shift A. This is how we add in things in Blender is Shift A. Go ahead and search for a transparent. We're gonna drop that in and then we need to add in. It's two shaders, so we need a mix shader. So go ahead and hit Shift A, search for a mix shader. And the reason we're doing this is because we have a number of these that are going to disappear as they move. So I'm doing this as a base material and then we're gonna copy it and make individual tweaks with the different numbers as we go along. Now we could do something with the alpha at the bottom of this, but I found the alpha is really glitchy. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I find using a transparent shader gets around that. So that's why I'm doing it that way. And I'm gonna switch these. So if you need to disconnect them, hold control and use your right click to just slice them. And then you can put them back in. I'm gonna switch them around. So now it's transparent at zero and it's fully on at one. So you can see it's not exactly doing what we want it to. It's not turning transparent, it's turning black. So we need to go over to our material settings here. We need to change the blend mode from opaque down to something like alpha hashed or alpha blend. Now alpha blend kind of just turns it on and off. I like alpha hashed because it gives this dissolve effect. The other thing you may want to do is turn on back face calling because as it disappears, it'll show that back face and it looks kind of weird. That'll just delete the back face so we don't have to look at that. So now we have our base material and we're going to reuse that over and over again. We can't just apply it to all of them. We're going to have to make different instances to our different numbers there. So let's say I apply it to seven. You can see that it turns them both on and off. And you can't keyframe up because the keyframes will be tied to the material. So it'll turn them both off and on at the same time. So we're going to have to make its own instance but now that we have the setup, we can just basically copy 90% of the parameters and just change a few keyframes. So I'm gonna make this one on eight, metal eight. And then I'm gonna click on seven and you can see this little two here, it's two instances of the material being used. You can click on that and it'll make a new material out of that. And I can change that to metal seven. And as you can see, it only affects the seven. So now I'll just go through and I'll make a material for each of them because they'll each have their own value that we can then adjust at any time that we want. All right, so let's go back to our layout tab. Let's go ahead and see how that looks. So now it's looking pretty good. We have a keyframe camera. We have a different metal material. We can fade things in and out as we need. You may notice that the metal looks kind of weird. What it's doing is actually reflecting the default background. So that's why it looks that way. We need to add in our own background. So let's go ahead and fix that so we get the look that we want. And that's pretty easy. We just need to go over to this uh, world tab and we need to put in a world background. So we go over here and instead of color, we will add in an environmental texture. So you shouldn't have to worry about this. I will link it in the description and I will have it in the template. It's this Nebula photo by Millie Mopstock. So thank you, Millie. Credit where credit's due. 
we're going to be using that one. But again, it'll be linked in the template and below. So it should just link up as soon as you open the template and you shouldn't have to worry about it. But let's go ahead and bring it in just so you know how to do that. So go ahead and just click on that, click on open and choose Nebula. Pretty easy. We're not seeing it right now because we are not in a mode where we can see it. So if I go over to this render tab, there it is. Our cool background, our metallic textures are reflecting that. Looks a lot nicer, a lot closer to our final product. Now, if I go back to my reference here, if I go back to the other tab and look in my camera so that I can see my reference video, you can see that the metal doesn't look quite right. It's really, really blue. And we're gonna fix that by adding some lighting. So let's go ahead and do that. Click on the eight, hit shift S, cursor to selected. Hit shift A and you can add in a light. I'm gonna use these area lights. So I'm gonna rotate it, I'm gonna move it back into position, and then I'm going to change a few of the values. And it came with some keyframes. I don't need to keyframe anything, so I'm just gonna clear all the keyframes off of it. So I'll change it to 1.5, 0 0.5, and one. I'm gonna change this to 60 degrees, and then I'm just gonna put in a few more parameters. Again, I've done this before, so I'm just going off of some of the values I used last time. I'm gonna duplicate that one and I'm gonna move it over. Feel free to pause if you want to get the exact ones. What's important is you know how to do it. And at this point, I assume that you can. So I'm gonna change this one to blue. I'm gonna also change the other one to blue. So I'll have three lights total on each of them. So we'll go ahead and look at that. Um, we're casting some blue along the sides and some nice uh, white light toward the middle. But uh, looks pretty good. Um, if you wanna change the background, go ahead. If you wanna change the lighting, go for that. It's, uh, it's all about you, baby. So. Uh, Keep on doing what you're doing. And you know the drill by now, so what I'm gonna do is I'm of course gonna take all these lights, I'm gonna duplicate them, and I'm gonna move them down in front of all our text. So you don't need to see the rest of that. You get the idea, it's just me putting lights in front of all of them. But I will show you how to animate, say the number seven, how to uh, fade it in and out. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, so again, I'm looking at my reference through my camera. I'm gonna go ahead and rotate this, and then I'm gonna fade it off. So around frame 50, it starts rotating. So I'm gonna go ahead and add in a keyframe. And I can't really see where it ends, so I'm gonna to have to take a guess. And again, it's okay, because I can actually move that end keyframe to match the rotation if it's not looking right. So let's assume right about there, it's fully disappeared and it's rotated 90 degrees. So let's go ahead and rotate it and add in a keyframe. That looks a little too fast, so let's go ahead and move that keyframe down. So right about there, something like that looks about right. And I'm just using my arrow keys to go back and forth through the keyframes to see if it looks right. Now that we have that in place, we can go ahead and make it disappear. So let's go ahead and go to our material tab. And then we have that factor, remember, which is between our transparent material and our metal material. So we'll go ahead and click this little dot to add in a keyframe. And then we'll move back to the beginning and we will turn it to zero and add in a keyframe. Now it's important that you don't click the keyframe and then move it to zero because that won't stick right. It'll just keyframe it at one. You have to make a change and then click on the dot. And you can see that I forgot to do exactly that and so it didn't uh, stick. It's really frustrating if you forget to do that. So cool, so now we've done what we wanted it to and it fades off, so uh, beauty fish, beauty fish. We have five, five rotates and disappears. Five does the same thing. It's a really similar process, so you don't need to see that. You're just gonna rotate it, add in some keyframes. Make sure you keyframe that factor on and off. So again, this is me going through a bunch of the other stuff, tweaking some parameters for like another two hours. Um, just to give you an idea, it took me almost five hours to do this first part here that we're going over. So don't feel bad if it's taking you longer. I'm not gonna do it in 30 minutes, um, but um, this is just me going through it. Don't worry, you don't have to go through it. There are a few more things that I will mention along the way. So right here, I noticed a mistake when I was trying to rotate the number five, it was rotating in the wrong spot. And that's because I moved those numbers earlier on. Remember when I tried to align those things, I actually moved the pivot point as well. So here's how you can actually put them in the right location. Go up to object, go to set origin and origin to geometry. And this will put the uh, pivot point, basically the center of mass in the center of your object. Then you can go over to the menu on the right and just zero out your Z position. So now you can see it's actually rotating in the right spot. Again, this is gonna be fixed in the template because I realized after the fact, so it's fixed, so you don't have to worry about it. But in case you made the same mistake that I did, because I told you to, um, this is how you actually do it. So now I just went through and I did the text. I'm just keyframing the rotations and position. Um, nothing new here. For the end where it's actually changing text, where it rotates and changes, all I'm doing is fading off one piece of text and then I'm bringing the other one on. Just a sleight of hand, nothing new here. Another note as you're going through this is you may notice that there are some weird shadows going on. Make sure that you go over to your render tab. Here's your EV render tab and go down to shadows 
and turn on soft shadows. So if you're getting weird artifacts and shadows on your objects, go ahead and try these settings. Go ahead and turn them off and on and just see if that fixes the problem. You also notice as you're playing through it, um, something on like images, it looks really weird. It's casting like a weird, harsh border from your lights. But when you pause it, it goes away. So this actually won't show up in your render. It's just a weird view display bug. So you can ignore it and you won't really know what this looks like till we put everything in there and we start rendering it out. Now an added thing I did because at the end there's a little bit of rotation. I took the camera and I parented it to an empty and I added in a little bit of rotation. But I also did it to the text as well. You can see the text pull out here. I parented that to an empty and so it just pulls it out as it rotates to get closer to the camera and then back in. Speaking of rendering out, let's go ahead and go over to our render tab here. That's 1920 by 1080, 100%, that's all good. We're gonna change this to an open EXR multi-layer sequence. And that'll help us out later. You can just go with plain EXR for now. And you do full float. And I go DWAA lossy. It's still great quality, but it's um, a much smaller file size. And especially at this point, you don't wanna be rendering out full. It'll just take forever. Uh, you just wanna see if it looks good. And remember how we said we were going to go 30, right now it's set to 24 FPS. So let's go ahead and change that so our playback speed's actually accurate. And last but not least, we need a place to save this. So I'm just going to go ahead and create a new folder, and then we'll select that folder, and all of our rendered images, it'll come out in an image sequence, it'll all be in that folder. And then I will just drag that folder into DaVinci Resolve, and it'll read it as a movie clip. So go ahead and render, go up to Render, Render Animation. And it'll start going through it. You can see it's going through fairly quickly as it renders the images. So it'll take a little bit, but uh, we'll look at it in a second. A few things you might want on are bloom and motion blur. They'll add a little bit more to your effect and it'll look a lot nicer. Of course, it'll make rendering times longer, so go at your own discretion. Okay, so now that that part's done, we need to add a material to this blue sphere here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click on it. I'm gonna add a new material, call it blue sphere. We can change it to a blue color. So now I'm gonna go over to my reference. I'm gonna mess with this blue a little bit, see if I can get it pretty close to uh, the color that's there. So that's looking pretty good. I'm gonna go ahead and click on my rod and just add in that material to it as well. You can get there through this little drop down right here. I'm gonna go ahead and play with that roughness a little bit. Since the material's on both of them, it'll change them both equally, so I'm not worried about that. And you may notice that there's a little glowing spot right on this material. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the cursor to select it, and I'm gonna add in a spotlight. So I'm gonna put a shine right on that. So let's go ahead and move it into the right location. I'm gonna move it up a bit. I'm gonna see what it looks like. While I have it selected, I'm just gonna change the radius. I'm gonna change a few other things. Try and get something that matches a little bit. It gets that nice bright spot on there. Now this is going to cause a uh, a little bit of a problem with our text because it's gonna be shiny on our text as well, but we will fix that later in compositing. So now I wanna add a, a little bit more here. So I'll go to my shading tab. So we have our shader here, and I'm gonna go ahead and increase the emission. The emission is just light coming from the object. I want a little bit of a glow coming from it. Go ahead and turn that up. Go ahead and make it a little bit blue. You can see it glowing. All right, look at that. I like the shine. It's pretty, pretty nice. You'll see that it's probably a little too much uh, but again, we can fix that later in compositing if we want. So I'm gonna leave it there, it's pretty good. We have it like 80% of the way there. In the next video, we're gonna go ahead and add a few things that we missed this time. We're gonna modify our background a little bit, and we're gonna add in those glass rings, which are the main reason that we're doing this in Blender. This would be almost impossible to do in Fusion. So go ahead and download the template. Don't forget to do some dabbling of your own, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>